I'm a biologist, and I work here at CU Boulder. And wherever I have lived, it may not be surprising that I've always wanted to know who else was living there with me. And I don't mean people. People are great. I'm talking about things like the gray tree frog on the screen, or the trees growing in your backyard, or the birds singing in the forest. I've always wanted to know about the natural world. I had the fortune to grow up on the shoreline of Lake Huron in Ontario, Canada. And when I look at the picture, yeah, some Canadians in the crowd maybe, um, or not. <laughs> you can still cheer for Canada. I appreciate that. <laughs> when I look at the photo that you're looking at, I can hear the sounds of the forest. I know the trees that live there. I know what it smells like. I know what swimming in that water is like. It's always been very important for me to know who I was living with. And as an awkward little kid, looking at all this biodiversity in my backyard, the biggest question I had was, where does it come from? Why are there so many different species of trees or birds or salamanders? What generates new species? Why do we have such a biodiverse world? And I thought, like many of you probably think, that to answer these kinds of questions, I would have to go far away. I could not answer these questions by staying at home. Maybe I'd have to go to the Arctic and study reindeer. Or I'd have to go to Antarctica and study penguins. Certainly, I'd have to go somewhere where nobody really lives. Maybe I'd have to go to the Galapagos Islands. They were important for Darwin. Maybe they could be important for me, too to understand where biodiversity comes from and why the natural world is so diverse. And it's true that you can go to these places and you can learn a lot. So I did that. As a graduate student, I went to the Guano Islands of Peru, and yes, the island you're looking at is not covered in sand. It is covered in shit. And in these islands, you know, I grew up in forests in eastern North America. These islands are really foreign to me. I didn't recognize the birds other than the ones I was studying. The sounds were unfamiliar. There was no fresh water. And I started to think about relating research to the public, particularly research about evolutionary biology and change, because these islands that I was experiencing are changing really rapidly. The birds there are struggling as they compete with people for fish, and also as El Nino events become more severe and more frequent. But when I came home and started talking to people about these amazing islands that I visited and the blue-footed boobies that I got to work on, I am one of the only people in the world who's ever sequenced a blue-footed booby genome, for better or worse, yeah. <laughs> it's really not that hard anymore, though, so hold your applause. At any rate, <laughs> the... <laughs> until later. Uh, I... <laughs> so when, you, when I was talking to people about my PhD research, my grandmother, my father, They'd never seen a blue-footed booby in the wild, and probably many of you haven't here either. There's no really intrinsic connection with them. Maybe you have a stronger connection with polar bears because they're used so frequently to document and message about climate changes that humans are making to our world. But I would hazard a guess many more of you are familiar with this bird. And if you're not, I'll forgive you. But right now, where we're sitting, we're surrounded by at least five or ten of these birds within 50 meters of this building. The black-capped chickadee is one of the most common backyard birds in North America. And here in Boulder, we have another species, the mountain chickadee. Both of these species are very, very common, and although you may not know it, you've heard them. They've been near you. They experience the same world here in Boulder that you're experiencing. And so rather than study things far away, my students and I are studying this place. We're trying to understand changes that are happening here in Boulder and along the Front Range by studying these two birds. But what do you think of when you hear the word hybrid? Maybe some of you think of a Prius. We do live in Boulder. <laughs> or some other environmentally friendly car. I think of these. <laughs> this is a pegacorn, for those of you not familiar with these magical creatures. As a small gay child in rural Ontario, I was obsessed with pegacorns. And <laughs> it's kind of interesting that now, as a biologist here at CU Boulder, I get to study the process that would technically make a pegacorn if they could really exist. <laughs> that is, one parent being a pegasus, one parent being a unicorn, the offspring a combination of traits of the parents. This is a liger. Ligers don't occur in nature, but if we put lions and tigers together, 
we sometimes get ligers. Hybrids are real things. And the idea of hybrid creatures has really fascinated humans for a very long time. There are hybrids in all kinds of mythology, whether they're centaurs, whether they're griffins. You most likely regularly eat hybrids. Have you ever thought of that? If you've eaten a pluot, for instance, it's a hybrid between two different species of fruiting tree. You probably are a hybrid. Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens hybridized a very long time ago in the history of Homo sapiens, and that's still with us. The truth is many plants and animals in nature hybridize. The outcomes of hybridization are variable. Sometimes it leads to the loss of a species. Sometimes it leads to really important pieces of genomes moving between species. The reality is that rates of hybridization between different species are increasing really rapidly. And hybridization isn't just a species breeding earlier in the year or eating different food. It's actively choosing to mate with a different species that may be millions and millions of years divergent. It's a really big change to the way species interact. And it seems like things we're doing to our planet are causing hybridization to become more common. That's not necessarily a bad thing, but if we don't pay attention and try and understand what's going on, we won't know if the outcomes are good or bad. My students and I are studying hybridization in your backyards. This year is the first year of the Boulder Chickadee Study, where we're studying both the black-capped and mountain chickadees that exist with us in Boulder, and we're watching how they interact and how those interactions vary from here all the way to tree line. We do that by putting up nest boxes, which you might see around Boulder. You can see some on main campus. These birds will nest in those nest boxes. We can capture them and take small blood samples, sequence their genomes, and understand it, how the changes that are happening, predominantly because of the ways we develop land, or the way that the climate is changing, changes the way these species are interacting. And for the non-birders in the crowd, I recognize these don't look wildly different to you, but these birds differ in that one plumage patch I just pointed out. And they're 1.5 million years divergent. For 1.5 million years, they've been on separate evolutionary trajectories, and now they're starting to hybridize. And it seems like they hybridize in places like Boulder and other developed places along the Front Range, and in other parts of North America. When we pay attention to our surroundings like I did as a kid and continue to do as a professor, we're more prepared to notice change. And I think that's really important as we become more and more disconnected from our surroundings. This is basically our backyard. We are fortunate enough here in Boulder to go up into the mountains, be in the subalpine, see subalpine fir and Engelmann spruce. When you look at this photo, do you think, oh, I could use more snow for skiing? Or do you think about the birds you could hear? Can you recognize the trees that you're looking at? Because if you can't, you may not be experiencing your backyard in a way that's important for you to notice change as change is happening. The things we're doing to the world have a larger impact than just our recreation. And I know many of you know that in this audience, but I still would encourage you to pay a little bit more attention so, pegacorns are magical and special creatures that I really wish existed in this world. The reality is, hybrids do exist and we can use them to understand the changes that are happening, the changes we are causing to the world. And although pegacorns are really special in their own right, the fact that we can pay attention here in our own backyards and understand more about evolutionary biology and anthropogenic change, human-caused change, I think is just as special as a pegacorn. Thank you.